Hi, my name is Adam Rogers, Technology Manager at Trelleborg Offshore, and today I'm going to be talking to you about polyurethanes. As for an agenda, I'll start off by talking about what actually is a polyurethane. Then I'll move on to the chemistry and the production of polyurethanes before moving on to the polyurethanes we have here at Trelleborg, the key properties of polyurethanes, and I'll finish with a summary. Firstly, what is a polyurethane? Polyurethanes were first synthesized by Otto Bayer, who went on to be awarded the Charles Goodyear Award, which is the highest achievement from the American Chemical Society. Often, polyurethanes are referred to as plastics or rubbers, but in fact, they're a classification of their own with properties that mimic both plastics and rubbers. Typically, they're made from the reaction of different types of isocyanates and different polyols to yield an infinite number of final polymer structures. There's lots of variants on polyurethanes and one single formulation can give you an infinite number of different properties for the final structure. Now I'll talk about the chemistry of polyurethanes. The starting point to all formulations are these long chain organic molecules with various molecular weights. This can vary from 400 to 4,000 Daltons. Over 70% of a complete polyurethane structure can be one of these materials. So picking the right one is ideal when you look at the end application for the polyurethane. For example, polyethers are used in subsea applications due to their excellent hot wet properties. Polyesters are using mining components due to their high abrasion resistance. And polycaprolactins and using dynamic applications due to their fatigue endurance. Next, we talk about these chain extenders. So the larger molecules are coupled with smaller molecules with much lower molecular weights. We call these chain extenders. These are normally amines or diols, as you can see by these examples here. Now, these chain extenders dictate the final polymer's cross-link density and their loading levels are tweaked to impact the final hardness and the ultimate mechanical properties. High molecular weight polyols and these low molecular weight chain extenders make up the polyol component to a PU system. The polyol component is reacted with isocyanates to produce the chemical reaction which is needed to synthesize a polyurethane. There are different types of isocyanates with pros and cons for the final polyurethane structure. For example, TDIs, which are on the top left of your screen right now, have excellent high temperature stability, but are volatile and hazardous, so dangerous in modern industry. HDIs, which are on the bottom left of your screen, have excellent UV stability, but are typically weaker with lower mechanical strength. In addition to the polyol and isen components, there's much more to a final polyurethane formulation. There are multiple extras to fine tune any formulation to specific needs. Things like reactivity, density, colour and rheology are all impacted by the final 5% of a PU formulation. And we add things like catalysts, pigments and various fillers to change these. All raw materials I've spoken about here have a near infinite number of variants and each combination produces a polymer with different mechanical properties. Flexibility in selection of raw materials allows for a final formulation with specific target mechanical properties. There are two main blocks in a final structure. There's a soft block and a hard block. The soft block is the amorphous phase made up of longer chain molecules things like the polyethers and polyesters that I spoke about. The hard block is the cross-linked phase, which is dictated by the reaction of isocyanates and chain extenders. These two blocks work together to give the final properties and the specific mechanical properties we need in applications. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the production of polyurethanes and the industries they're used in. Polyurethane surrounds us in modern life. If you look around the room that you're in right now, things like the foam in your chair, the soles of your shoes, the adhesives in your computer, and the varnish on your tables, 
all probably made up of polyurethanes. So it shows how fundamental they are to life as we live today. They're also made in numerous ways for all the different industries they're used in. Open casting of polyurethanes is something we use all the time here at Trelleborg. Things like bend stiffeners and bend restrictors are made by open casting polyurethanes. You can also spray polyurethanes. Things like waterproofing membranes and coatings are typically done in this fashion. But we can also trial out polyurethane screens. They're often used in hygienic floor screens in things like the pharmaceutical industry. The flexibility of the formulation and also the flexibility in the production methodology makes them the ideal choice for many industries and applications. Now I'm going to talk about some of the polyurethanes that we hear here at Trelleborg. We use polyurethane chemistry every single day across the globe at multiple sites. We process tons and tons of the material every day using different polyols and different isocyanates to react to make hundreds of different variants of a polyurethane. Each variant is treated with the exact same precision to maximise part quality. Stiffeners, restrictors, cable protection systems and thermal insulation products are critical to Trelleborg and have been perfected over years and years of use. Now I'm going to talk about the key mechanical properties of polyurethanes. There are multiple properties of polyurethanes that we test every day at Trelleborg. Things like tensile strength, tear strength, water absorption and thermal conductivity are measured highly specifically to look at the products that the polyurethanes are used in. Now I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about tensile strength and fatigue endurance. Tensile testing is one of the most common tests that we perform here at Trelleborg. This involves application of a load in tension. Essentially, we pull a sample of the material until it breaks. An example of a test result is seen on the right hand side of your screen. And you can see how much information we can get from just one test. For example, you get the basic stress strain trace, you get the ultimate tensile strength, the elongation of break, and also the modulus of the material. We've performed this test across multiple temperatures to fully characterize the material. It's a critical aspect for designs, but it's also a common test as part of QC methodology to validate the high quality of all the parts that Trelleborg produces. We test it on dog bones of the material, which we stamp out from plaques of the polymer, or we actually machine these test samples from cast parts, which highlights the properties in a finished part as well as a small sample. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about fatigue testing. Fatigue testing involves application of a dynamic load to a sample. There's two types of fatigue tests, load controlled and displacement controlled. Load controlled involves application of constant stress to the sample, whereas displacement controlled is application of a constant strain. Normally, mechanical tests are performed in a static manner until they break, which is really quick and only takes a few seconds normally. Fatigue testing takes months and months or sometimes years and is done either on a lab scale or a full size scale. We perform fatigue testing on a full size scale to validate a design or the final product, but it's done to replicate its service conditions. An entire lifespan of the material is mimicked in a reduced time by increasing the strain rate and the frequency of the test. We validate designs for 25 years in service in just a few months or a year of test. We characterise the fatigue test by how many cycles are performed alongside the hysteresis loop. An example of a hysteresis loop is seen on the bottom right of your screen right now. Now, hysteresis loop tells us lots and lots about the fatigue capability of the material. As the load is applied, there's an increase in stress and strain for the material. As the load is taken off, the stress and strain decreases as the material relaxes. The area between these two traces is the work done for the material, which is essentially the fatigue and the heat generation from the test. 
There's two fatigue tests or two hysteresis loops on your screen right now. On the left, we can see a hysteresis loop with quite a big area between the traces, whereas on the right, there's a much smaller area. Because the trace on the right has a smaller area between the traces, it means that there's less fatigue going on to the material, and so it will last longer in dynamic applications. Whereas this test is quite long and quite expensive to perform, it's critical in understanding that the quality of our parts are maintained across the entire life cycle of the product. Now I'm going to summarise what I've spoken to you about today. Firstly, polyurethanes are a type of polymer composing of hard and soft lock segments. They're carefully formulated and are formulated in a way that are very flexible to fine tune the final mechanical properties. These polymers provide protection to a large variety of structures in highly demanding environments all over the world. They have key properties such as tensile strength and fatigue endurance, which I spoke about in a bit more detail, but also different properties like tear strength and water absorption. The flexibility one can achieve through bespoke formulation allows for their use to be incredibly varied in multiple industries. We perform strict and extensive testing at Trelleborg on components manufactured using this chemistry for assessment of the performance across the product's lifespan. And this lifespan is normally over 25 years. Thank you very much for listening today. If you've got any questions, please get in touch. Thank you.